Welcome everyone, Dr. Thor here, get ready for Gnosis. Well, I wanted to, uh, well, I finished the book American Shaolin uh, by the Matthew Polly, the man who wrote the definitive book, or so it appears, on Bruce Lee. I haven't finished that book um, um, quite yet. Um, <clears throat> but I want to listen to more of it. Uh, he shows Bruce Lee in a very balanced way from what I can see so far. Um, but I'm not sure what all that means. But uh, <clears throat> this is about him deciding to go to uh, China and learn Kung Fu and uh, doing that. Now, um, this is a hard book to really relate to in any way whatsoever. Now, Matthew Polly was made a list of the problems he had in life. He's kind of wimpy, kind of unattractive, kind of uneducated, and then decided to change that in high school by uh, getting involved in certain activities, starting, uh, it's hard to believe, starting a Spanish club in high school and finishing some other higher um, <clears throat> training so that I'm assuming he could not that he's very detailed about it, score well on his SAT test so he could get into Princeton, which apparently he did. But this is not easy, and Princeton doesn't just look for SAT scores. Uh, you have to be something, which is why he stated he started the Spanish club. And, of course, you have to know a foreign language. You can't get into any higher schools unless you know a foreign uh, language. That's our pre west uh, rescue it. Rescue it? So, the whole idea, it's required uh, as part of the admission program that you have to speak a language other than your own. So, he did all that, apparently got into Princeton, and um, this was supposedly started in his late or beginning of high school. And all of a sudden, he has all this money from mommy and daddy who were putting it away for him. How nice. Certainly, uh, that's what parents should do to take care of their children. But, you know, going to Princeton's very expensive. I don't know if he really paid for that or not. From what I understand, nobody leaves. I was listening to several years ago a Princeton a person who went to Princeton. And he said none of the people leaving Princeton leave with any kind of debt. It's all taken care of for them by alumni and everyone else. And this is true. The only people that have debt are people that go to quasi-college, UCLA, other colleges like that. But, you know, Ivy League people have lots and lots of money and lots of lots of patrons uh, that take care of anybody who's ever went there. So this is the case as well. But he claims, uh, I don't know, he didn't state anything yet again. I don't like that because I like to you know who is this guy? Where's this money coming from to go to Princeton? Now, <clears throat> even if you want to go to Princeton, even if your family wants to save or whatever, um, it's a lot of money. You're talking yearly tens of thousands of dollars. Could be even back then it could be twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year. Where did that money come from? Apparently he had a college fund and this is what he used uh, to go to China with and to pay the fees the Chinese wanted. Now, what this really turns into is not a story about the Shaolin, how they work, or anything else. It's really like a guy who went to a gym and the people he met at the gym. And uh, I think we should get through all the illusions of life. And it always amazes me how when you really get down to everything, um, it's a very common way of functioning in the way of life. <clears throat> it is not people... Uh, like you see in the Kung Fu the TV series, or even Kung Fu the Adventure Continues, a fantastic TV show with Carrie Dean that was on for four years. One I tend to forget uh, to tell people about, but you should really check that out. A lot of magic, a lot of mysticism, and um, a combination of good martial arts and some gunplay. Uh, so really great martial arts series, probably the best of all. But we remember the Kung Fu in the 70s, which was this very philosophical series, uh, which was done extremely well, and people really loved it. And they loved the philosophy, which they had never heard of before. Well, you can flush that down the old toilet, because you ain't going to get nothing here. Well, he went to the temple, he found it, they charged him a fortune, uh, ripping him off as a Westerner, even charging him more than most Westerners actually double to triple. Uh, people went there and they were paying like 500. He was told to pay 1500, I think, or 1300. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, and found this out later. And I believe he stopped paying him that extra amount, was able to get away with it uh, after much argument and almost being thrown out. So we all know that the Shaolin certainly weren't looking uh, to help people or to perpetrate their philosophy. 
Do they have that? Well, the point is, is that he certainly doesn't talk about it, and he's got really nothing profound to say. This is really about a book about him and when he went through and how he integrated it into his life to try and change his ways and his little list of problems in life that he had that he wanted to change. Now, <clears throat> I'm not sure. It's not very philosophical in my way. He looked at his life and said he wanted to change it. I guess that is philosophical in its own way. <clears throat> but there wasn't a single great thought ever coming out of his mouth. I've watched different interviews with him. He tried to write this book very comically and very put in a lot of humor. I've seen him on talk shows. He tries to do the same thing. Um, he's a very tries to be very humorous um, on something where people are really seeking philosophy. <clears throat> There really seems to be no philosophy. Not only that, the monks apparently were illiterate and unable to write, so which is very typical of peasants in that day. So most of them could write, most of them could do this. So, um, and you know, what was it? <clears throat> well, to me, the whole book is like going to a gym, and what was happening in the actual gym situation was the fact that, well, these are the people you met at the gym. <clears throat> You know, the guy who's a good fighter but having girl trouble. Another guy doesn't have enough money. And this is basically what the whole thing is about. And I think that that's very true. To think that this is some sort of monastery where people are priestly um, and acting in that manner is not. And he talks about the social life there, the horrible problems, of course, with Asian women that people should know. People think that Asian women are very, and this is thought of as European women as well, that they're very open sexually and everything else. They're not. There's a lot of prostitutes in Asian countries, and it's a big part of their culture, but the average woman uh, and uh, is not, and very subdued, and uh, they v value uh, virginity as part of marriage like just about all the rest of the world. But people think of Thailand and the prostitution districts, or even the Philippines and other places, and China itself, which has a huge sex trade. But it's not legal in China, and uh, but there is it's everywhere, and this is a way that the triads make a fortune. And there's uh, endless amounts of, uh, if people go to China, apparently, of constantly being propositioned, or they have porno um, little business cards stuck in their uh, hotel room door. 10, 20, 30 in the nighttime, um, somebody selling their wares, pimps selling their wares. <laughs> so I think that's important to understand uh, when we get through it. So there is a little of that. He threw some of that in, apparently had some sexual encounters. Um, and he talks about a lot about the people that went to the temple that weren't there in terms of living there or teachers. Uh, people coming from different cultures, particularly Europeans or Americans who went there to learn all this stuff. Well, I don't really care about those people. What I was reading this book for was to find some intrigue or some in-depth look at uh, the philosophical and possibly some sort of tips on uh, martial arts. Zero. Well, there's really nothing going on. These are people that work very, very hard every single day, training for six to uh, six to eight hours. And if you train for six to eight hours every day, you're going to be pretty good at what you're doing. What I was amazed at is that he wasn't really trained in any internal martial arts. There was nothing really there. There's a couple of statements about Qi Kung, about centering yourself into the middle of the earth by running a string from uh, your basically your waist down into the earth, and then of course you can't be moved. But you know there really wasn't any in-depth information on this. What I found very interesting is the way that they developed iron chest, iron head, iron wrist was the fact of abusing their cells by striking, like with iron wrist, which he actually learned to do, is that you strike a tree over and over again with your wrist until you're in horrible, horrible pain. Then uh, you keep repeating this, and they put some sort of herbs on it, wrap your wrist, and then you just do this repetitively, kind of like building up a callus. This was their way of being having iron whatever. Well, that's not what I understand of using chi, but there's no talk of chi whatsoever, and this day, this book predates uh, this big chi evolution and uh, that hit everybody. So, he talks very, very little of that in Qi Kong and Sending Energy. He does mention it a little bit, but it's all followed up by whacking something, hitting somebody. 
And so, of course, uh, you know, these monks are pretty good because that's all they do all day, 24 hours a day. They live in fairly poor surroundings <coughs> back then. And, of course, a lot of that changed even on his return visit, I believe, 10 years later, uh, where things were built up and this was a major tourist uh, trap. But it was a tourist trap back then as well, and a lot of people went there. Matter of fact, he does mention that a guy from Yale went there and wrote a book on his experiences. Hopefully, it's a lot better than this one. Um, so there's really nothing there. They talk about each person, where they come from, their poor background, how they train there. But I mean, there's really nothing. They also talked about how they were learning so many other traditions. <laughs> Here we go again. You know, American martial artists who have claimed that nobody allowed you to learn other traditions seem to be something set in greed and um, of the instructors that came here, particularly the Oriental instructors that came here that didn't want you learning from others because of the fact that it confused the system. You think that's really the reason? I don't think so. It had the fact that they didn't want their students going to other instructors and possibly losing them, meaning losing their money. We also know that there is a huge amount of racism everywhere in the world and it's no different in Asia where the Japanese who murdered over 20 million Chinese butchered civilians uh, and have been doing it for literally a few hundred years if not thousands. But of course the Chinese all think that they're special as well and they don't want to teach the white man uh, martial arts. Now this is typical everywhere. It's even stated in um, empty force book written by that Chinese guy who states that, you know, uh, it's not really advisable to teach Westerners they don't get it. Well, maybe this is true. Maybe they don't have the same kind of thinking. And I do think that different cultures think differently. Uh, we are not all similar. We have vast cultural differences that are extremely profound when you get more and more into each other's culture. Uh, the fact that we all need food and housing over our heads, well, yeah, but that's kind of an imbecilic way of looking at things. It's really ignorance because you haven't studied uh, or lived in other countries and found out. We have that even within the United States. Of, well, Southerners act one way, Northerners act another, um, you know, Western people. So, I mean, there's, and there's all these prejudices against everybody. So, this is quite interesting as well. But this book really doesn't give you any. I was looking for training secrets, techniques. Nada. There's nothing in here. He'll talk about how much work it was and how he did this and that. But there's no techniques given. There's no talk about it. There's no internal arts. There's nothing. This is a vacuous book all about me, myself, and I. Oh, I don't feel good today. I'm hurting. Well, that's right. Anybody who starts a gym program knows how initially how painful it is. And he goes into the training. Anybody who would train for hours and hours every day is going to get some major, major results. Now, um... Was it the fact that these guys were so great and better than everybody else? Well, there seemed to have been some element of that. These um, Shaolin people were uh, challenged by a few people. And I don't know if these people were anybody of note. And I'm not sure you'd go to China and uh, challenge them. There was one karate guy from Japan who went there. And he gave a comical uh, view of how this guy was fighting. And he was taken out pretty quickly. So, and he thought he was a big Japanese master, uh, but it didn't say he was a master. It was just this guy that showed up to want to test himself. Is, is that anything that we need to know about? Well, I think it's interesting to a degree, but this wasn't some big master coming from Japan to challenge the Shaolin master. It wasn't, and he was easily dispatched. Now, does that mean that that karate was no good? I don't know. I don't know. Now, we don't know either because he doesn't explain very well. Um, so basically this entire book is his little jaunt there, how I feel. He lived on uh, Coca-Cola most of the time. He talked about getting extremely sick and how the Chinese abused him. Not the Shaolin people who tried to help him, but he went to hospitals and they ignored him. Even the doctors even walked out of the hospital he went into, refusing to treat him and just disappeared. Well, this is pretty shocking, people, but everyone should wake up and understand that uh, the world does not love each other. The world is not interested in Westerners and doesn't like them. While they want to take your money, um, that's about it. 
So this guy almost died because of the fact he couldn't get treatment. And of course, then says he miraculously got over his dysentery. Um, and I'd like to, you know, it was, it was badly written there. But um, the bottom line is none of the doctors would help him there. He went there half dying and they just said bye-bye and gave him the same pills he had before that didn't work, which were anti-diarrhea pills. Um, apparently there were no miraculous uh, Shaolin healing. There was no herbish to take care of problem, even though they had herbish for other problems. But this problem, there's no herbish can help. You know, this is another contradictory thing that I have to wonder what's going on here. Uh, but the point is, is that it just shows you how nasty people are. And I've been trying to tell people for years that nobody likes anybody, and particularly nobody likes Americans. So if you think you're going anywhere with your smiley face and your big wallet, well, they'll take your money and they'll make sure that you're the first one to stop a bullet for them or if they can rip you off. Like Americans have been doing for 70 years, protecting the lousy scum, otherwise known as Europeans. So the whole idea is that this is what goes on. And, you know, this book really shows uh, the extent uh, that uh, these people will go to disrespect and virtually kill you. What's interesting is they talk about, uh, of course, as I mentioned briefly, sexuality and violence. You would think that these countries would allow people to be punching each other all over the place and there's nothing to it. Well, that's not true at all. Violence is frowned upon and if you get in some sort of altercation, uh, you're going to get arrested and you have to pay your way out of it, usually thousands and thousands of dollars. This happened recently to some black guy at some restaurant uh, who got into an altercation. I don't think there was even anybody hitting each other, but stuff was thrown around, etc., because he didn't want uh, to speak with these Chinese people. So they got an altercation, and they fined him $40,000 or four years in prison. So needless to say, he's in prison right now. This is the kind of things that happen. So don't think you go to places and it's a punch out and the Kung Fu comes out and people fight each other. Well, this is not true. And if the police get involved, you're in big trouble. Uh, and these things are highly enforced. So uh, this is how things go all over the world. So that's something to note. So if you want to learn a little bit about uh, Chinese culture, not Shaolin culture, but Chinese culture, this is a great book to get some insights into. In terms of what the Chinese did, well, they went to the gym and practiced hard every day. Now, if you wanted to develop Iron Head, you hit your head on the ground a lot. Generally, this uh, caused people to then have permanent headaches, getting a kind of a permanent concussion to develop this. Uh, people who wanted iron fist, well, they would beat their hand into sand for hours and hours, basically pushing their fingers in to a large extent and wearing off some bone and so forth. This is the kind of things he did, like I mentioned with the iron wrist, where he hit his um, arm against a board endlessly. Um... So the whole idea is that uh, it, it's a big mishmash of very primitive. It's like you would go to the military and you would talk about boot camp uh, to be uh, trained here. There were no anything special beyond that. Um, as I said, he lived on Coca-Cola, which we, he was able to get in his local town that he could pay for. And this was his big thing. Uh, certainly not a good diet to be on, especially if you're trying to go to higher levels. But there's nothing about this guy that ever talks about higher levels. He talks about the fact that I'm kind of poor, stupid, and cowardice, and I want to get over that. Well, you know, that I don't know if that's philosophical. You're talking about your personal problems. He's not waxing philosophical here. He's not talking about uh, looking at things in a particular way. He's not talking about the wisdom he got. You know, this isn't a flashback in Kung Fu, man. No, 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 no. Oh, master, what will I learn from almost dying in the hospital and the doctors telling me to get lost and actually leaving the hospital, master? What do I learn? Well, grasshopper, you learn nobody gives a shit about you. <laughs> so this is the whole bottom line of it all. So, and of course, money speaks everywhere. And if you have money, of course, you get around better and you get all the things that money gives you. 
So, uh, but in terms of what's going on there, there's nothing there. You know, this guy is coming from an upper middle class. Mommy and daddy had tens of thousands of dollars in the bank to pay for his big shot college. He went back to Princeton and got his degree, etc. Now, uh, what did he do after that? What he's doing? Well, you know, he's written another couple of books or whatever, which apparently have all been kind of bestsellers. I guess that he's made enough money off of it. Um, uh, the Bruce Lee book is very interesting, but and apparently that sold relatively well. It's been out a while. Nobody really pays attention to him. I notice on YouTube, he has very few views of anybody wanting to listen to him talk. Uh, and that's because he kind of comes off poorly uh, in general. But you know, he's not really looked at anybody seriously. And of course, that's the way most things are. Even though you think the Bruce Leophiles, those little goofballs um, that worship him, and again, everybody was practicing different traditions, and it was just a bunch of lies that he stated, uh, and all those other people that stated that in martial arts, that he invented mixed martial arts, just not true. Yes, he did incorporate it, but people have been learning other styles uh, as much as they can from anybody. And apparently the Shaolins are very big into Chinese boxing. And there was a, some sort of group of Chinese boxers that they went over to and spent a lot of time there learning their system because it was so much better, basically, or it gave them more fighting skills. So this is all uh, talked about in the book. There's little things, but certainly there isn't anything here that we can go into, talk about how philosophical. I mean, they weren't using internal arts or chi, something I was looking for. Uh, you know, smashing your hand in a bucket of sand over and over for days and days and hour and hour and hitting your hand again. Well, I'm not sure what all that means. So you toughen up areas of your body. This is an old way of doing it. And then, of course, that makes that area particularly stronger. But there is no philosophy there. There's absolutely nothing here. This guy's not a deep thinker. He's a little comic wise guy. Um, and that's it. There's really nothing here. So, you know, I certainly don't recommend this book. I'm not sure what anybody would get out of it. Um, there's nothing really to learn uh, here whatsoever. There's no techniques. They doesn't talk much about anything in terms of, well, if you do this and do that, it's a great way to punch harder or kick better. There's some very minor stuff in there. Certainly not enough to really uh, warrant getting this book. So I'm looking forward to listening to the rest of his Bruce Lee book to see what exactly is there. But, you know, we know the story of Bruce Lee as well. And he always seems to come up uh, everywhere as well. I mean, it's not really complicated uh, his entire life. And it's really all come out now of the kind of guy that he really was. But he certainly was a great showman and he was a great martial artist. I mean, he certainly knew the moves. He knew what looked good and he practiced many styles and apparently was very personable and he was extremely strong. On the other hand, he also had all the common frailties that everybody has, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, which isn't much for a guy that people think that he was some sort of wise man when all he really was doing was taking drugs and humping. And of course, he looked good doing martial arts, but he certainly was not this wise guy passing that on. He went to school and learned uh, philosophy in Seattle. Oh, that suburb of uh, Peking or something? Uh, is that a great school of oriental thought? No, no. That's a Washington State University. So <laughs> this is what we all have to understand. And that's kind of the same letdown that you get from this book. Until next time, everybody.